So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming in for this session, uh, which has got a pretty interesting name. It's called We Chips, as you probably would have seen. Education trends back in Asia, in Vietnam, Philippines, China, India, Indonesia. And we have a pretty interesting panel out here. So I'm not going to you know, introduce anybody because everybody's profiles are already there with you folks. Uh, what I'm going to do is jump into the discussion. And um, I'm going to start with Angela. Okay, so Angela has been in uh, uh, the investment business and uh, has a couple of investments in the education space. I just wanted to you know, start off uh, by telling all of us as to uh, how you go about it and what do you see and what are the opportunities that you see. For your company. Yeah, yeah. So Sunovation is a pretty large fund uh, based out of uh, uh, China. So we are uh, running a Silicon Valley office here, and I'm leading the education investment in the US. Actually, we have more than a few education investments. Starting from about 2013, we have invested almost 30 companies between US and China in the education space. Of course, that ranges from K-12 all the way to higher up, and also the professional skill training uh, combines you know, online offline models. Some of the interesting thing, uh, things we have observed in the uh, uh, in the last, uh, I would say, two or three years between U.S. and China is that, because you know China has a booming after-school market where parents are pouring a lot of money to provide a supplementary education for their kids. Because the formal education system, they feel like so ossified and the, the content they provide out there is not enough to help their kids outperform other peers. So they have all the kids sending to you know math camps, English and coding and different stuff just to make sure they, are, can, they can stand out in the formal education system. So that's kind of become a essential extension part of the formal education. So all the kids go to those weekend camps on the weekend after school. Whereas in the US, you know, the government and also the like the private like foundations, like all the social impact players, they, pro they, they play a pretty dominant role in education, whereas parents don't need to, you know, provide a lot of, you know, supplementary, you know, uh, like a private tutoring themselves after school. But the school themselves got a lot of, you know, funding from the government or from the foundations, from whatnot, uh, for the, uh, uh, the supplementary education for kids uh, in both schools and also from, uh, for the tools and the hardware, you know, the devices, iPad stuff like that, this they can receive in the schools. So in the U.S., we look a lot in the innovation in the school system, like what kind of things that can teachers or school leaders or students can use at schools to improve their learning out there, whereas in China, we're more focused on the after-school market. Mm -hmm. Just a yeah, very broad picture like this. Okay, fine. And doctor, uh, what about you? I mean, you, you've, you've started in Vietnam, uh, Topica. And I just wanted to, you know, uh, understand and for the audience exactly uh, what Topica does and how they do it. Sure. Uh, hi everyone. So uh, my name is Tuấn Phạm. I'm the founder and CEO of Topica. So we started out of Vietnam about eight nine years ago with a uh, online degree enabling program. So we work with eleven universities now in the region, Vietnam and Philippines mainly. Uh, and then we uh, we started following the demand of uh, adult uh, learners, uh, working adults. So. Uh, after the first or second degree, they would uh, need further skills, uh, courses for, for the actual assignments on the job that they, they do. So we started providing uh, our second product, the uh, Edumo platform, which is uh, about 1,000 courses, uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, how to do PowerPoint, or even how to play guitar or, or raise your kids. So, uh, so everything an adult uh, learner would need. And then the third program we we are providing right now is uh, English uh, conversation tooling mm -hmm. because what we found is also it's uh, very crucial for, for people to work for international companies or, or for example software outsourcing is picking up so Vietnam is becoming the next destination so we providing them the, the uh, IT skills and the language skills so they can serve their customers so we're building an ecosystem around this and about uh, half a million students so far mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the four countries, the four largest countries in uh, South Asia Mm -hmm. uh, which are in total about 500 million population, so half of the size of China. Yeah. Okay, fine. So having said that, I want to move to China, and Jerry yeah, could give us sure. some more details about iTutor Group so that we get warmed oh, up. Oh, sure, sure. So in China, we operate two brands, two big mm -hmm. brands, VIP ABC and VIP Junior. So they focus on, as Angela's mentioning, the two big segments, adult learners and then children. Uh, we've been doing this for, gosh, about 18 years now, um, all online. So the idea is, and we talk about trends here, the idea is now there's, in these countries, in all of these countries, Asia especially, education is a high priority. There's a disproportionate amount of spend, both time and money on education, from children all the way to adults. Because uh, fortunately, these countries all value education. They understand that education can change uh, a person's life. So, but what we also see is a trend in 
um, a desire. Th there's a lot of offerings out there, right? So there's a sh huge trend on what works now, what drives efficacy. I want to learn a language. I want to learn English, for example. So we're the largest one in China. But they don't want to just know that I teach English. They, they actually want to come at the end of the day and really learn English, but not just English, English in a way that is beneficial for them, for an adult. Why are they learning English? Many different reasons. Probably the number one is obviously career moves. So if you're an engineer, do you want to learn English from an elementary school teacher? No, that doesn't make sense. If you're good at certain skill sets, weak at others. So you want to have something that's personalized and tailored to you. So efficacy is huge, even for young learners. Young learners do learn English in school systems today. As Angela is mentioning, those school systems are all standardized. So they teach you chapters one through 10, right? Through a standardized curriculum. And that's fine, but there's all kinds of curriculum out there. There's all kinds of teachers out there. And there's all different kinds of ways of engaging with the students that really drive learning results. And so at the end of the day, the trend I see, the biggest trend I see shifting in education is, look, I'm gonna pay you a lot of money, you know, and it doesn't matter if I'm poor or rich, I, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that whatever I learn, whatever results I want to try to achieve, I get there. And everything you do as an educator, whether it's technology, I know this whole conference is about tech, whether it's service, whether it's content, curriculum, et cetera, if your focus is not on that, your customer will know very quickly right. and will call you out on that. Right. There's a lot of language learning and, you know, with Pulkit from Vedantu in India. Uh, I think it's slightly different out there, right? So you want to just tell us exactly what your platform does exactly, specifically subjects? Yeah, so and I'll put it this way. So uh, I'm actually a teacher. So after graduating from college, I started teaching kids and uh, eventually we built an offline tutoring business out of that where we taught more than uh, 50,000 kids in our institution where I personally taught more than 10,000 kids. The problem in India is accessibility of good teachers, one and uh, the personalized attention to every kid. So usually uh, you'll see that uh, in school it's like rote learning and uh, accessibility of great teachers definitely is a problem, especially in the far-flung areas. Uh, keep aside the, the metros and the big cities. In rest of the cities, you will not find great teacher going there and teaching the kids. So how to solve that problem? So uh, uh, we eventually came out with a live online tutoring platform where we the, because of the model itself, we can source teachers from length and breadth of the country. So we have 500 plus highly curated and well-trained teachers on the platform, which teach students, uh, which are from various cities, tier one to tier four, tier five cities in the country. Uh, in the last one and a half years, we have taught uh, students from more than 300 plus cities across the world, uh, not just from India, but from the Middle East and the, the South Asia in general. and. Uh, we, we realize that there's a lot of value that can be added to a child's life, as uh, the others also mentioned. You know, the, comp it's the South Asia is highly competitive because everybody values education. So if you have to make your life better, you have to educate yourself better, get into a good college, and that will ensure at least, you know, guarantee some level of good life for you. So, but it, it, it sort of becomes like a funnel. So at every level, a filtration is happening. So wherever you put a filter, you suddenly need extra help, extra tutoring. So this is what is driving tutoring business in India. So after school, almost every kid in India goes for a, a tutor. Uh, but this tutoring is highly unorganized, fragmented, lacks quality. So uh, that's what we are trying to disrupt uh, through Vedantu model that's online. So uh, just coming back to the two of you, in China and Vietnam, is it similar? Is it the tutoring market uh, extremely... Disorganized, yeah. yeah. Angela, you yeah, want to say I just something? wanted to stress one point. I fully agree with what Puki said about this. You know, the insufficient uh, quality of both uh, both quantity and quality of the good teachers. Because when we start looking in the U.S., like over the last three years in the education market, there's such a huge focus on personalized learning. Like yes. you know, there's like on average, probably there's a, uh, for the K-12 system in the U.S., there's like one teacher versus like 20 students or so. Right. But I'm sure in in our home countries, right, China, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, India, I mean, the, this imbalance is even worse. Like yes. we have like 
one teacher for probably like 60 students or so. Like right. How come they can get enough attention or enough support, especially in the very key stages of the cognitive and the learning development, right? So before, there was uh, some, uh, too much focus, I feel like, you know, focus on the tools and services that try to replace teachers to, uh, to you know, automate this learning for, for, you know, for kids to learn on their own. But then you feel like, oh, there are services and tools that can benefit both teachers and students to improve the quality of the teachers and quality of them will, you know, help them to provide the best services for students as well. Like in China, we have like all different tiers of the cities, right? Tier one, like Beijing and Shanghai, everybody knows, but then there are tier two, tier three, so, uh, uh, tier three uh, uh, cities. There are, there's no good enough teachers or not a uh, good enough system to develop the teachers for their teacher skills. So there are uh, a, a, a new generation of the companies that provide this online kind of tutoring, you know, for them to, uh, for, the, for the kids in the tier two, tier three cities, you know, for them to uh, be taught by the tier one uh, uh, school teachers or for the tier one, tier two kids to receive the education from the, you know, teachers from the uh, developed countries like the US, Australia, right? right. Like VIP kid or, or, uh, or, or the box fish we have uh, uh, invested in China. And also there's another separate category where are, there are tools that kind of assist the teachers in their own teaching. For example, the tools help the teachers prepare their lesson plans. Like before, teachers have to spend like 10 to 15 hours a week just to prepare. That's like pre-teaching time to prepare the, the homework and lesson plans. And there are tools that can capture data right now from both teacher side and students have to provide that to ease their, to ease their uh, the work you know, uh, after, after the, the right. formal teaching hours. And there are tools that can help teachers with uh, uh, grading with you know a homework kind of you know assessment, so everything everything like this is helps the teacher to make their job easier and for them to focus the best on the in person time or in the core teaching time with the students. So that's a key component as we see in this developing countries more okay. education markets. Jenny, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Too. So uh, one of the th it's a very good point on the offline tutoring because what happens now is in the regular tutoring schools, what they've done is they've kind of replicated what's the problem in the regular schools, right? So why is it okay that you can have a ratio of one to 20 or one to 60? Why, why do we think that's actually okay? Why isn't one to 10 okay? Why isn't it the other way around? Why isn't it 20 to one? Why can't one student have access to 20 teachers? Right? right? And, and so you, you, you immediately say, well, well hold on. Uh, Andrew's bringing up the point, geographical boundaries, time constraints, et cetera. But that's the beauty of online. Those, those don't exist. But then here's the next step of the problem. It's not just about two people. It's not tender for education, right? It's not, oh, I just match people up in marketplace. It's about actually then figuring out really what's going to drive the learning results for that individual learner, right? So then you, ha you have this proliferation of marketplaces. OK, I have a bunch of teachers here. I have a bunch of students here. Let's Let's figure out, let's do Craigslist and figure out if they work. And, and who's going to suffer? It, number one cost of education isn't money. It's time. The time wasted. That's why higher ed is being killed right now. Because you spend four years. Not, it's not the 120000 you spend over the four years. It's the fact that you spend four years, uh, let alone. Even if you forgave all of those loans, it still doesn't matter. It's about time. I always joke, if I said, if I, I go to VCs and investors, I said, if someone can invent a pill, and that pill, you just swallow it and you learn whatever you want to learn. You, will, you would beg, borrow, and steal. Thank you. Thank you. Are you working on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, I'm going to invest in that. But you, but you would beg, borrow, and steal to pay for that, right? Because it's about time. It's not about money. Um, and so changing that model, but also adding all of these tools necessary, it's not even about the teachers. If you're doing something for the teachers, mm -hmm. that's actually wrong. If you're not taking that value chain statement further, why am I helping the teachers? Because I'm trying to help, ultimately, the students. So if, uh, a lot of times I see ed tech companies where they kind of stop at one part of I'm helping the administrators, I'm helping the schools, I'm helping the teachers. Um, if you can't finish that value proposition, then that's, you're really not in the education sector, candidly. OK. I have a question, doctor, for you. Uh, you know, Asia is, uh, and all our countries, right, are extremely traditional. Mm. Okay, education in these markets, like Jerry said earlier, is driven by the family. I want my son or daughter to get educated, learn, and therefore, if I get a good education, like Fulkit said, I get a great job somewhere probably. And that's the, that's the psychology. And uh, how do you get people to adopt 
to these online learning platforms because the parents are not yet geared up to online study. They still want their kids to go to real world colleges. So how do you, and Jerry, how do you, you know, sort of um, get them to adopt, change the mindset? What do you do to do that? I think uh, the way we approach that is quite similar to, to, uh, to Jerry, um, to the group. Um, uh, we target adults, so the ones who are paying for their own education, they know exactly uh, what they need, what they're looking for, they know exactly whether the program is good or not. Uh, we did try before to go into K-12, which is a, a lot more complicated, especially in Vietnam, because then you have to satisfy the, not only the student, but also, the, of course, the parents and the teachers who is monopolizing on the, the student's time. Mm -hmm. So they actually fill up the whole week, so there's no free slot for the student to to learn anything else un unless the teacher is agree agreeable to that. And the school principal and the district uh, government. Mm -hmm. So there are five uh, customer or constituencies to, to satisfy at the same time uh, because of this uh, uh, a lot of uh, over-regulated uh, right. system. So, you, yeah. you're so going we target the adults yeah. okay. who, are, who are paying themselves. Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. So, Fulkit, uh, like, I think in India it would be different what you're doing. How, how do you overcome that? Because I see that very strong in India. Yes. So, Especially you're doing specific subjects. So, so uh, rightly said, uh, we are doing specific subjects. Uh, we especially focus on the maths and sciences, which are uh, key to competitive success in, in, uh, success in India. The problem with us is, since we focus on K-12, uh, the decision maker is the parent. And in India, uh, and in, I agree that most of the South Asian countries, uh, the education is a decades old behavior where the things have been happening in a certain way. So if you go about changing it, there's resistance. Add to it the thing that, you know, education is mission critical. If I'm a parent, I will not take a chance or a risk with my child's career with something new. So it's all about trust building for us. So uh, getting people to try us out itself is a huge challenge. So what we're doing right now is we are trying to reach out to parents in offline channels as well, where we talk to them, we educate them, we show them the value, give them some trials. Once they see the value, as Jerry also, also mentioned, once they see the value, the student sees the value, there is no stopping beyond that. So do you, so, do you actually have marketing programs targeted towards the parents? Yes, majorly parents. Specifically, and have you seen any kind of significant change of behavior? Yes, uh, we have. Yeah. So, uh, so so once a parent sees the value uh, in the student's eye, uh, so for example, if we give a trial to a child in front of parent, suddenly you know the, all the stakeholders are in tune. They see the value, and the the decision making happens very fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we are trying to yeah. do right now. And, and, Sure. No, I just add one quick comment to that. Education is a long game. You know, we're yes. all like, very focused on the learning results. Like you know, Jerry and Fouquet has have mentioned. So I said probably the first or two cohorts of the students from a learning center is probably the best marketing you can do, right? Because if you show there's improvement in their scores, or they get into some really good schools where they speak English, but they are from a like purely Chinese speaking family then that's a huge booster of confidence for the parents mm -hmm. to continue invest in that. Okay. So I would say the offline, the, whether it's engagement or marketing or customer acquisition still cannot be avoided, even though we're all doing the online stuff. Right. So Jerry, uh, talking about uh, you know, in China, uh, I mean, you're completely online, that's what you said. So how do you go about this whole adoption rate? Is it just that people just come to you because English is, everybody wants to learn English? Oh. Or you, you, know, you have a sort of a pull strategy too? What, what exactly. exactly. So. Um, in China, there's, there's a myriad of offline players doing English language learning. So that industry has existed okay. for, 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 for decades. There's even pseudo um, online, right? The phone. There used to be the phone. People would call and, you know, you have a buddy on the other line. So, uh, so there's been all kinds of mechanisms of, of, of learning English language learning. Uh, to Angela's point, that's exactly correct. People want, it's about trust. And it's, you don't want to wait too long to gain that trust either. They need to see that, that change or that transformation at the first class, right? And the number one, you know, if you don't talk about acquisition costs of students as part of education, then, then you're going to have a big, big difficult time running a business. But the number one and the only way I feel like because education is about trust is through other customers' referrals and testimonials. It has to be through that because 
that's how it exists even today in offline schools, right? Mm -hmm. It's about trust um, and, and understanding that. So it's, while we're completely online, it doesn't mean we have strong partnerships with people that are either experts in the field or have, have that trust layer that help us acquire that first level. But after that, you quickly move. So while we've been doing this for 18 years, we actually started in the adult space because that was a completely underserved. Imagine you're an adult trying to learn English. Okay, yeah, there's after school programs, but you're with a bunch of kids. I'm not, I'm a vice president at a bank. I'm not, I'm not doing that, mm -hmm. right? So it's a huge underserved market. Well, those people have kids too. So they're wondering why. So as you can see already, we've created a market just through that process mm -hmm. by itself. And that helped a lot with that initial acquisition process. And then that just grows. So that has to be a key strategy of anybody in education is how do I grow that business through, um, through your product effectiveness as well as through your customer testimonials. Right, so talking about partnerships, you know, for all of everybody on the stage, how do you see partnerships with the real world helping your businesses or your learning platforms? Doctor? Well, we started out uh, uh, leveraging on existing brands of university partners. So mm -hmm. some of them are from the top tier uh, layers. So, so that's how we, we build the trust over time and, and the brand. And of course, that's only give you so, so much uh, leverage for a while. So, but after that, it's uh, all about quality and, and testimonial of uh, your students. And then uh, the, our second product for the short courses platform, of course, we also leveraging on, on uh, popular uh, teachers mm -hmm. and, and instructors who, who have a lot of uh, uh, content and existing courses that, that are very popular. So we help them scale further. And then, of course, we, after that, we start looking out for new faces to, to develop and, and help them. Yeah, okay. What would you share? Yeah, partnerships are not easy in education, mm -hmm. right? Because education is a very established industry. Um, and so the, my peers here are doing something that is trying to disrupt that industry. So it is sometimes very difficult. So what you want to do when you leverage some of these partnerships is really focus on those that are, are forward thinking. They understand that this industry has to change, but they, don't, they may not have the tools or the capabilities to do that, and that's the best kind of partnership because then together you can leverage their existing infrastructure, partners, they, their own partner network, or they're even their own customers uh, or teachers, for example, and content, and then bring them. But those, that's the key, is to fi really focusing on those that are really forward thinking. Otherwise, you'll be just recreating the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're really trying to change that, like uh, you know, these guys here as well as us, then uh, that's, that's the kind of focus you want to find. And not easy, there's not a lot. That's why these conferences uh, we really like this conference. That's why these conferences are so important to find these right. kind of right. partnerships here. Right. So, Fulkit, you're doing subjects. Do you have? Do you believe that you'll be able to make partner with colleges and schools in India, keeping in mind the nature of these yes. schools? Yeah. So, uh, for everybody's information, schools in India are highly regulated. Okay. So, doing anything with them requires, as uh, others mentioned, you know, going through multiple channels. So we definitely are trying to partner with schools. Uh, we have seen some successful partnerships in uh, some areas where schools lack quality teachers. So they want Vedantu teachers to teach their kids online. Okay. So, but it's, it's limited. And uh, I see problems happening at scale with, with regulations. Uh, on the other hand, we are trying partnerships with some ad tech players. So Vedantu focuses on primary learning, which requires time commitment as well. And as Jerry mentioned, time commitment is the biggest thing. Right. So we are replacing offline tutoring completely. There are online content players today, which are getting pretty uh, deep penetration in the Indian market mm -hmm. with their videos and tests and those kind of uh, supplemental learning tools. So we are trying to partner with them. Okay. So students do uh, take their content, but wherever they get, get, they get stuck, they can you know, come on to Vedantu to learn the entire concept and the entire curriculum. So, but yeah, broadly, doing partnerships in education is tricky. A lot of people see U.S. competition, and that makes it, you know. Yeah, so I mean, talking about U.S. competition, uh, one of the things I wanted to put to the table here really mm -hmm. is about, you know, within the U.S., a number of universities, and, you know, they're, they're, they're having a huge online education program for international markets. Does that affect any of your learning platforms in any way? I don't know, I'm just asking a question. No, I think that's actually good. Yeah. If, if, yeah. I, I think the challenge for the universities is to adopt those programs, mm -hmm. but I think 
there's a few companies like to you for example that are really helping them but I think that's a great trend in general but you're correct it's it's one of those businesses it's like the Phoenix you have to kind of rise from the ashes because you're disrupting yourself essentially right um, so that's that's something you have to be careful yeah. I, I see one area also is in the publishers mm -hmm. I think the publishers are realizing that they have great content great brand but their model is changing mm -hmm. and um, so they've been pretty good partners we have partnerships with Oxford uh, University Press for example to not only take their content digital which they have already but really then integrate that into a learning experience mm -hmm. okay so then that way their value in the whole value chain is expanded greatly and I th again that's a partnership again where they're really forward thinking and, and trying to figure out how do I take what I have but do even more with partners okay. and, and, and not feel like it's competition. I feel like educational world is a pretty local or regional market. Like how do you do, deliver this education, right? How do you design this process? How do you measure like step by step of the learning result? It's a highly culturally different thing. So I think the, the market here in the US is large enough you know, for the local players and also for some emerging players here mm -hmm. to have a different market. But back to the partner questions, I think Jerry and Fouquet make a good point, but that's more focused on probably for the consumer facing product. But partnership, I think it would mean very different things for business facing mm -hmm. uh, companies and products. Like there's a, like probably starting from 2015, uh, as we are, you know, collecting more like data and stuff, you know, from our education, you know, classroom environments, there are a, a series of companies in trying to deploy very interesting technologies, mm -hmm. you know, to provide, you know, automated learning or provide more, you know, uh, like computer vision, like a face tracking, you know, to track, you know, whether students are engaged enough in the classrooms or developing <laughs> tools to help them to automate the, the, the uh, test paper or home, uh, homework, you know, uh, assessment processes. These are the tool or technology for the companies. So for them to have a major enough impact in the education market, they often will go to the other education institutions in, instead of directly selling to consumers themselves, because those are lean startups, right? They don't really have the resources or the existing like student following or the marketing resources to do that consumer branding themselves. So when they are you know, when they are here in the US, they probably go after like the publishers or higher ed you know, institutions or the school districts, because they can leverage those you know, uh, budgets uh, you know, to going to the students uh, in the hands here. But when they try to go to Asia, you know, where it's a volume of the students is you know, multiple times than here, they will go for the best education partners in the market you know, mm -hmm. in Korea, in Japan, in China, in Southeast Asia, like whether we can provide these tools or these really interesting tech-driven products to help you have an even better competitive advantage in the local markets. So that's also something we try to you know, broker between our friends and our uh, portfolio companies in the US with the partners and really best companies in Asia. Right. So that's an interesting trend going on as well. So I have a question for you, Angela. Uh, question being, uh, you know, you've been investing in a number of learning platforms, mm -hmm. education companies, et cetera. Uh, what, what is the success metric that you would look at three to five years down the line for these companies in which you've invested? What's the success metric for your company, especially when you're investing this kind of money? What, yeah. what, how would you see it? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, for the short term, from our view, from our like investors' view, or from like internal monitoring perspective, I would say the retention of the students is probably one of the best metrics. Because if they take your one class and you come back, you know, next year, next semester, and they come back again, you know, for K6, we have like five or six years, right? And then for higher ed, they probably come back for two or three years to get different skill, you know, trained at your platform then that's a really good you know, vote of confidence for your education, uh, for your learning, for your teaching, uh, uh, the, the quality. But going forward, whether they are uh, you know, overall probably you know, um, uh, have better, uh, for example, like incomes or have better you know, uh, application, uh, admission rate into a better schools than their peers who are now taking the class from this platform, then that's more like a longer term metrics. But internally, we, we see how, how, often the, how often the students or parents will come back or the, the NPS net promotion score from the teachers and from the school leaders. So we do need to hear like the educator, their point of view, like whether they feel like this is something really adding value to their students. Right. So you're yeah. saying the success metric really would be the NPS score, which is the net satisfaction There's score? There's more like quality, and qual qualitative qual side. And we have quantitative side, which is more like economic than financial. OK. Yeah, All right, interesting. Yeah. Please. Yeah, speaking of retention, so um, we also use that as our, our key uh, metric to, to measure our, our uh, quality and progress. So. And we're quite proud of that, actually. So, uh, so uh, it's a uh, eighty-seven percent over twelve months for our, our degree wow. programs, and it has been huge. going up about three percent per year over the last uh, three years. So we started out uh, seventy-nine, eighty-two, eighty-five, eighty-seven, and as far as I know, it's uh, it's put us among the top four, five 
uh, institution in the U.S. Uh, okay. So with 87 percent. So, and I want to go back a little bit about the partnership question, an interesting one. So, so uh, there is this uh, interesting dynamic. So a lot of uh, great U.S. institution and startup they want to expand and scale globally. Mm -hmm. So when they go to each of the regions, of course, they would look for uh, someone with scale and quality and. And maybe we have done something right over the uh, last few years. So usually people who come to South Asia, they find us. So we have a partnership uh, with ASU. So oh, we're announcing do? soon. Okay. We have a partnership with uh, Voxy, very interesting startup from New York. We have a few more partnerships in the pi pipeline. So usually people go to the region, they look around. Uh, the next competitor is about one-tenth or one-twentieth of our, our revenue size. And they also take a look at retention rates and the other metrics. So, so when you say you're, so when you have these tie-ups, you are actually providing their programs through your platform. Uh, yes. Yeah, so usually we help them. Uh, of course, we tend to be uh, careful about which program we, we distribute. So mm -hmm. make sure not to stretch ourselves too thin, and make sure it uh, brings value to our, our exact target students. So so focusing on adult, adult learners, but. Uh, uh, yeah, but there are quite a few interesting uh, partnerships in the pipeline. Okay. So any of you in the room thinking about going to South Asia, please <laughs> find us. <laughs> you want to say something? Yeah. yeah then. So uh, I'll put it this way. Uh, in, for the partnerships and then for uh, the, the, the question that you asked later. So around 10% of the entire ex the spend on education, say in India, happens on foreign education. So India and uh, I think the Asian countries are very aspirational. So that's why in higher education, a lot of partnerships have actually worked out. So where, you know, a uh, lot of students who can't go out. So the, these foreign universities have partnered with their Indian counterparts, and they are getting some sort of degree or certificate affiliated with the foreign universities, and that really works out. It also adds to the trust. We Indians especially tend to trust the Western education system higher. So anything which is affiliated with a Western university, college, whatever, suddenly gives you a, a trust factor, which is very important for the conversions to happen. And, uh, and the companies also. So if you have a foreign degree, then you have a higher chance of getting a job. So you know, uh, the, the tangibility is much higher. And of course, uh, how do you rate your business? Your second question. It has to be retention, and it has to be the, the, the proportion of business that you're getting through reference. Because no business in education can survive without value, and these are the two factors which uh, clearly show the value that... The so, Fulkit, let me ask you a question. Yeah. What is your USP to the student in India to come to you? Because you know that in India, online is a challenge. Okay, there's uh, access issues, there's hardware issues, a lot of people can't afford a desktop, right? So how do you overcome that? So what is the USP? Why would they come to you? So Because you're actually trying to overcome a challenge yourself. Yes, yes. So. so I put it this way. So my challenge is not just to take education online, just change the medium. My challenge is to, is to make it at least 10x better, make learning at least 10x better, so that each child gets personalized learning, so that his outcomes are much higher as compared to the peers, probably who are doing the, the, the rudimentary offline tutoring. So one, I have to satisfy the child on each and every day, in each and every session. Uh, by giving extremely personalized and standardized teaching. Second, finally, it has to be the school examination result or the competitive examination result. If that doesn't happen, if the child doesn't improve, it will all come falling down. Okay. So okay. that's how. So these are the two things that two things. matter. Jerry? I, I think um, everything we're saying here, if you kind of really boil it down a little bit, and uh, I've said this in, in some other education conferences, education is a service industry. Right? It, it really is a service type of industry. You are serving your students, okay? They have a need, whatever it may be, career, test, it, it really doesn't matter. They have a service that, just like this beautiful hotel, right? There's different kinds of services that you can get. But if, we, we have a, a saying that there's no such thing as a bad student, right? But somehow in education, we can treat students like a bell curve. Right, that it's the only industry in this world that can do that. If Amazon, Google, or Facebook, or any other mm. tech company treated their customer like a bell curve, they'd be out of business. Somehow education's still thriving. So, but if you flip it around and says, look, I believe that education is a service industry, then one, knowing your customers, students, two, delivering exactly what they want, no questions asked. It's not about money, 
It's not about anything, it's not about hardware. You know, we have students where maybe they don't have the best hardware, hardware brace to get a virus. I have a team, I have a team, a specialized team, that their only job is to work against the company. They have full authority, they have unlimited spend, they can do whatever they want for the student, literally. So if they want to send an iPad, carry it over, all set up, 4G access, done. No question asked. You want a refund? Done. I, you don't want, you don't, and I'll still keep your account open. The key is their students willing to change their life so they can learn something, so it's our job to change ourselves for them. So going back to how do you measure success then, if you want to look at metrics, I think, yes, retention is stage one, but uh, my founder, uh, Ming, always says, you know what, I really don't want students to come back. I want them to learn, so they don't have to come back. But what I really want them to do is, for us, if possible, is to tell everybody else so that they can also improve, right? So retention, while in the short term is correct, long term it's about getting others uh, because again, back to that whole referral trust um, um, experience. Right, so iTutor, does it give tools per se to people who are wanting to learn and to get onto your platform? Absolutely, so. so can you highlight a little bit yeah, more Yeah, so at the core of us, we're a technology company. Right. So I have about 400 plus engineers. We, our entire stack from whether it's our live interaction system to our learning management system. You know, I have close to about 20,000 teachers in 80 countries, so I have to manage all of them. I have to pay them, so it's all, the entire. The other key piece that really differentiates is, again, back to how do I know who you are? Mm -hmm. And how do I make sure, with all these teachers, how do I make sure that I get you the right teacher at the right time? It's on demand, so I need to know who you are. So that's a demographic profile, career goals, student goals. But then you evolve over time. For ex let me give you, uh, I'll give you an example. Since all of our systems are our own systems, I not only know the, re the after results of the, the session, I also know what's going on in session. I know, are you speaking 10% you know, of the time, 15, 20? I also know how you're speaking with the teacher. So I know, is it back and forth or is it lecture style? Or are you interacting with the other students? So that, and then which one yields the best results? So then the next teacher, the next content, the next students, oops, sorry, the next classmates I put you with, I'll make sure to optimize that. So that's the key, is how do you continuously improve that learning engagement class after class? And it's not just two people chit-chatting, okay. it's, it's actually a, a whole full experience, even the classmates you're with. Yeah. Doctor, how do you, uh, let, me, let me pick up on that uh, fascinating yeah. thought. So, we also don't want them to come back if, uh, so we, if we taught them English, we don't want to come back to English, on the, yeah, right? But design, yeah. we want them to start working and then they should come back after a while for Excel, Microsoft Excel. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Next yeah. for the next career. And, and the 21st century, and I, I heard a fascinating keynote yesterday, online unfortunately I wasn't here, uh, you will have to keep learning over your lifetime. Yes. Right? Because one degree or one, program is not enough anymore so because the skills are changing so fast. So we want them to come back, keep coming back uh, every couple of years to, to study something new. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's why the platforms like you know, Udacity or Coursera or K-12 companies have a whole diversified you know, portfolio of courses. You're not coming back for the same content, but for the better, for different skills, for different grades, it's like that. And you can track the data you know, across the platform for the same student taking different grades of classes and different courses. That's okay. how we track. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so for example, in India, uh, to satisfy and give the value to each child, we, we, we had to build the entire platform from the scratch, the entire live teaching learning platform, uh, the, where the teacher writes, the, the video and audio communication happens. We had to code it from the scratch for India situation where it's, you see frequent disconnections. So for example, if the audio is out from web, we automatically connect them through the cellular network so that you know, at least the conversation is going on. Mm. So and, and adding to what Jerry said, so I'm glad to see that we are following the same approach. So I put it this way, today in the digital world, we can, for the very first time in human history, can mathematically measure what happens in teaching and learning engagement. So today we measure 60 plus parameters inside each session to give uh, timely interventions to the child. Typically what used to happen was, I'm learning, I'm going to a class. After six months there is an exam, I failed. And then everybody comes to know, oh, you failed. But today, in the digital world, I can tell after every session that the child is learning or not, is he engaged or not, 
is teacher teaching effectively or not as per the child's own personal level, pace, learning style. So today with the help of technology, we can actually completely change the way teaching happens. So personalization is not just about putting one teacher with one student. It's about intervening at the right time by understanding the child and the child's learning style and level. Yeah, so instantly you yeah. come to know how the yes. child's performing. Exactly. It's instant gratification. It's not, it's not, we're not taking, you know, the one thing our technology can't do, we're not babysitters, right? So we don't, that's the one thing I guess we can't replace maybe offline schools. But I think exactly to the point, look, our students want to fail, but they want to fail in the session, right? Yes. Not when it counts. And they want it now, not later, mm -hmm. right? They want immediate uh, feedback. So that's also why you don't replace the teacher, right? The human is the most important factor. Uh, so we, we have this, we call it this business model, but human to human is mm -hmm. still the model. It is a service model. It is not going away. But everything else you can help that teacher and that student, for example, if you can provide dynamic content, if you can give tools that says, look, you know, Jerry's not speaking enough, can you engage him with him? All of these kind of tools just augment that experience. Whether it's, we have now, uh, we had something called Tutor Glass where we use Google Glass, so then now it's a more immersive experience. You know, 360 environment because kids get fidgety, so they want to be able to touch things and interact with things. But those are all not to replace the teacher, it is tools for the teacher, so that way they can give all of that live interactive feedback. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So keeping uh, uh, you know, a tab on the time, I want to go in for one more last question for you folks. Uh, and I'll start from that side so Angela can finish, okay? <laughs> because you. she started. <laughs> okay. So uh, Fulkit, I mean, this question is for all of you all, okay? Uh, you've been in this business for some time. I mean, you've run successful business, you're running a successful business, you're running a successful business, and you've invested. How do you see the future as far as education is concerned and online education is concerned? Maybe in few words, each of you for conclusion. Well, uh, in my eyes, the future is really bright. Uh, there's a lot of problems in education to be solved. Uh, the major in my mind is personalization and contextual learning. So uh, for example, in schools, we teach so much. In our colleges, we teach like for four years. But it needs to be contextual about what the child needs to learn, for what. But before that, we have to understand the child. What's, what is the child's uh, learning style, inclination? Give him contextual education to achieve something meaningful in life. So I think technology can do it. And that is the direction in which the technology will, will soon move. Within okay. 10 years, we'll see a lot of contextual and personalized learning, meaningful learning happening through technology. Okay. Jay. No, I'm, I'm, I think uh, very excited about where education is going uh, at its current trajectory. Uh, although, especially the three of us sitting up here, we wish it would evolve faster. But we also have to recognize that not everything's ready. There's a very you know entrenched uh, industry. So, um, what I do see is that um, it's not just a technology shift only. It's a it's a complete mind shift, right? Like I said, stop using the bell curve to treat your students, your customers. Actually, literally think of them like your customers. I always get the question about profit, nonprofit. You know, at the end of the day, somebody's paying, right? So the, the better thing to think about is they're your customers. Traditionally, in, especially in Asia, this is a student, this is a teacher, right? Where in this world is that business model existing, right? It should be at least this, if not this, right? But it's, the, it's again, it's a mindset. It doesn't mean that teachers are obsolete or not valuable, it just means really good teachers are even more valuable than ever before. So I think um, I, I'm very excited to see a lot of mind shift uh, and push towards that. And I really um, encourage, especially technology companies, to not try to replace or, or redo something that is the old way into just tech, a techie way, but actually see if you can start to disrupt it. And I think if you need money, you need capital, resources, I think you're, this is the time to find it, and you will find it. Great. Doctor. Um, I'm very excited both in terms of uh, skill and quality for education. In terms of skill, uh, people talking about education being the last uh, information industry, not, not yet disrupted. So we see uh, online advertising disrupted, video disrupted, uh, communication, social networks. 
This is the single last uh, industry where you can deliver everything through information and it's not being disrupted. And the size, uh, some estimate, put it at seven times uh, the size of the whole telecommunication industry together. Wow. So Apple and Samsung and all the telcos multiple by seven. So think about how much you spend on your, your family's education versus right. phones and subscriptions. So that's skill. So one day education will be, everything will be online. So we think about it as electricity. So there's no longer online versus offline. Everything must be some, in some way online. In terms of quality, this is one of the few industries where you can actually improve on quality the bigger you scale. Because uh, fascinating to see uh, how, how Jerry mentioned they invested in analytics and data. We're mm -hmm. also doing that. So the more data you have, the more uh, algorithms you have, uh, the more learning your AI uh, doing, the better quality you can deliver. So it's a scale and quality improvement at the same time. So very, very excited Great. in the okay. next few years. I, my ending thoughts will be that impact of, of online education will go beyond education. Right now we're seeing all these online emerging trends that are start like chipping the corners or improving or disrupting the traditional education industry. But going forward, I believe that it will have a, a long lasting significance in, uh, in resolving some of the social economic issues. Like for example, the affordability crisis for US higher ed here, right? And the, our young adults will have like six figure student loan right after they graduate or we'll have this imbalance of teacher and student resource issues and cause the middle class family anxiety in China, in Vietnam, in, in Thailand, in India. And online education is start to uh, democratize these resources for everyone they want to have access to the quality education. Okay, great. Uh, I think thank you very much, panelists. Uh, with that, we'll have to conclude this presentation, uh, the panel discussion. Uh, we have another panel discussion followed following this one, so please stay on. Thank you very much, all of you.